Hello, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you cutting edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and stories from the road from MIT Sloan faculty and alumni. Today, we have Niti Sanyal joining us. Niti is currently the strategy director at Artifact Group, a strategy and design firm based in Seattle, Washington, that believes in the power of design to make change and do good. Niti graduated from MIT in 2002 with her Bachelor's of Science in Management from the Sloan School, and she holds her MBA from Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. She has been active with the newly formed Sloan Women of Seattle group, recently hosting a workshop for alumni in the area on this very topic of design thinking. We're delighted to have Niti involved there, and we're so thrilled that we could make this time together to share more broadly with the Sloan community. Niti, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Greg. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my firm, Artifact. Um, and we're really part of a new movement that's happening um, where design is going through an evolution um, to be more responsible. And so I'm excited to share with you all today about where design is heading. So um, Artifact is a strategy and design consultancy that's based in Seattle. And our firm and our clients are working to create better features by design. Um, and we're using new methodologies and tools that I'm excited to share with you today. First though, um, I wanna start with my own journey to design. Um, it's one that spans almost two decades um, since I graduated from MIT um, um, in the undergraduate program in 2002, course 15. So since MIT, I've actually had three different careers that shaped, shaped my life and perspective. So I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, my first career was on Wall Street. Um, and so uh, from graduating from 2002 and joining Wall Street, I was really interested in understanding financial markets. Um, and I was studying really um, the factors that make certain companies um, have outsized returns and why others didn't. I was, um, you know, very interested in innovation uh, back, back in those early days really wondering how disruption happens and why incumbents can never see the disruption coming their way. Um, and I was interested in how certain companies could create products that were so radical that we couldn't even imagine them. Um, and then in particular, I was really interested in how we can harness innovation uh, to change our lives for the better. And in fact, it was this last question um, that really brought me to an organization called PAC. Um, and so PATH is a global health organization and it's based in Seattle. And what it does is it works to bring um, life-saving health technologies to those in need. And so at PATH, I worked on uh, several different medical products um, for developing countries and it helped protect people from infectious diseases such as HIV and polio. Um, and what I learned at PATH is that some of these um, challenges that we are addressing to improve um, health outcomes and address inequalities um, were incredibly, incredibly complex. Um, and so um, I saw, but I also at the same time at PATH saw many um, successful solutions. And oftentimes these solutions were co-created with the beneficiaries that they were meant to serve. Um, and so it left me wondering, you know, what other types of methods um, could there be um, that would uh, tackle some of these so-called wicked problems, um, and essentially uh, really change people's lives for the better. So that's what really brought me to this, um, the firm that I'm at now, Artifact, which is a strategy and design studio based in Seattle. Um, and I actually first learned about Artifact when I went to an MIT alumni event in the Seattle area. Um, and at that event, I heard a panelist speaking about Artifact and the designs that they created. Um, and from that moment, I was really hooked on, on what the firm does. And it was not only because it had a steadfast focus on craft, but also because it, um, the firm had great ambitions to do good. Um, its mission is to create a more equitable and sustainable future, and it really resonated with, with me. Um, and so that's why I joined Artifact, and that was about five years ago. Um, and so here are some of the uh, products and services that we've created uh, over the course of my time um, at Artifact. Um, 
And you know, these span a, a wide range of products and services across uh, many different industries. So here you'll see some products for the automotive sector uh, where we thought about how communication should happen between the car and yourself. Um, we did um, some uh, healthcare products where we thought about how um, we could help patients deal with epilepsy. And a lot of these um, innovations that we created for our clients um, span sort of two buckets. One is near-term um, innovations, things that uh, are uh, improvements on the products that are out there. And then others is blue sky thinking. So thinking several years ahead, what the ideal experiences might be for users. Um, and so we often straddle those two um, types of projects across the different industries. Um, and then the process that we use um, at Artifact is very similar to those of other design agencies. Um, and it's essentially grounded in a human-centered design process. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with human-centered design. Um, essentially, uh, you know, it can be visualized through many different ways. Uh, this is just one way to visualize it. Um, but essentially, it's grounded in the same sort of premises um, as those that you might have seen with the double diamond structure, where uh, you are going through various phases of divergence and convergence to better understand a, a problem and then to create a, a solution and test it in the marketplace. Um, and so, you know, essentially, uh, uh, this is uh, really the, the main methodology or process that design firms use. And um, it's really focused on humans um, at the center uh, of it. And so essentially human-centered design, its main focus is to improve how things uh, work, work for people. But um, what I'm gonna argue today, and I hope you all agree, is that there's a need for an evolved model of design. Um, and so, and there are many reasons for that, and I'll, I'll go into it in, in a few moments, but essentially, um, Design is now being applied to more complex problems, um, and our designs are existing in a world that's more interconnected. Um, and this is really important to keep in mind. Um, and so what I mean by that is that design is um, being applied to more complex problems than it has in the past. So typically in the past, uh, human-centered design has allowed us to create things like the football helmet that you see uh, in the top corner, which is an object, right? A physical object that exists in the world. And then um, in more recent years, in, in the past couple decades, it has been applied towards software design, like the um, product that you see here for financial services for a bank that is based in Canada. Um, and so this is a, these are more typical applications of design. But as design has been very successful, as it has created outstanding returns for companies, they're off, they're applying this methodology to uh, more complex things, things like design of services and designs of systems. Um, and so when we say a design of system, um, design can actually help improve an entire transportation system, for example, or uh, the way that retail um, is done and exists in, in, a, in a city. So um, we're starting to see that this methodology that has been proven to work for so many years is now being applied to a slightly different uh, area than it has in the past. Um, another thing that's changing is that we're connected in ways that we never imagined. Um, so uh, if you look at the data in terms of the amount of miles per person that we've um, flown uh, over the past decade or so that has uh, doubled or tripled, um, of course, we are having this level of connectivity with mobile phone technology and even access to the internet in the most remote regions of the world. Um, and these are really great outcomes of connectivity, but connectivity also um, creates things that we have to be a little careful of. Um, it allows foreign governments to essentially uh, affect the way that our, our domestic uh, democracy works. It results in products um, like the Amazon uh, Echo and other similar products where the content needs to be moder moderated and curated by people uh, located all over the world. And sometimes it creates traumatic effects as the people who are um, moderating the content are um, sort of feeling the um, disastrous effects of viewing some of the content that's just um, really, uh, you know, quite troubling. 
Um, and so we're becoming, you know, um, acutely aware that, uh, that the products and services that we're designing, given the fact that we're living in a more interconnected world and we're trying to solve more complex problems, um, design field hasn't really caught up. Um, it's failing to produce solutions that recognize these shifts in the world. And we are creating some products now that um, have a lot of uh, unintended consequences. And so an example is YouTube um, and how it leads to digital addiction uh, for, for certain people and um, other uh, algorithms that get created that uh, create new biases, um, as well as you know, the effect of social media and uh, the impact that it has on, on people and communities all over the world. So um, obviously uh, uh, these failures of uh, these complications were never directly intended, um, but because uh, the design process sometimes optimizes convenience um, and engagement as outcomes over others, um, uh, I think that the field uh, is, is ripe uh, for, for evolution. So um, as a field, uh, design must do better. It must align customers, uh, business needs, society, and planet. And um, in order to do this, um, it really has to think about the intersections of the outcomes for all three of these areas um, and really think through the negative consequences of the designs that we introduce. And if this sounds familiar to you, um, because of um, a lot of the uh, advancements and works that um, Harvard has done around shared value. Um, what we're saying here with, with um, the field of design is that it really has to embody those principles of, of shared value. Um, so I just wanted to comment briefly on why now is a really important time to be thinking about uh, the future of design. And really the simple answer is that tech is an amplifier. Um, it's it's uh, you know creating um, a, a lot more rapid uh, um, impacts in, in the world today than we would have seen otherwise. And technology is getting more and more powerful with uh, the types of algorithms that we're introducing in the world. Um, and so to ground that in a concrete example, um, you know, we've, in the area of behavioral science, we've known for um, many, many years now that if you put cereal boxes at the bottom of the shelf and they're, um, uh, you know, have really bright colors and cartoons on them, uh, the kids will gravitate towards these uh, sugary treats um, and choose these these types of products. Um, and so that's been learned over time and, and that's that's all well and good and companies have realized to do this because it's quite strategic for them. They are able to sell more cereal boxes. Um, and so that's only slightly concerning. Um, but when you look at technologies um, such as those developed by Amazon called the Just Walk Out technology, which is in their convenience stores now, um, allows you to go and select items um, and put them in your cart and essentially walk out of the store without having gone through a checkout counter, a counter um, and it charges your mobile phone. Well, the, the way that it's able to do this to create this wonderful seamless experience is by sticking cameras everywhere. Um, and so if you imagine this technology being adopted uh, across all the stores you visit, uh, not only in person, but online, um, there's a rich, amount of data that we can get, it's, it's a lot worse than simply putting cereal boxes at a lower shelf. Um, for example, companies now might have a deeper understanding of what your emotional state is as you go and visit these, these outlets on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it might know what you purchased based on certain uh, emotional states and then could possibly um, manipulate your emotional state so that you purchase certain things. So you can see how it can get hairy really quickly um, and why technology might be an amplifier in a way that um, it never was the case before. Um, and so the question we've been asking ourselves is really how do we design the future more responsibility? As I mentioned, the time is right. Um, and we all want to take more responsibility for what we're doing, um, both as professionals, um, in our personal lives, as well as in uh, the designs we create for, for our clients. And so I'm gonna share some thoughts on, around how we're doing, um, how we're trying to enter this new field called responsible design. Um, and I just wanted to sort of caveat that we don't have all the answers. This is happening live as we talk. Um, and so I'd love to just hear your thoughts and opinions. Um, and I think this will be a really interesting evolution that unfolds over the next few years. Um, and so it's 
still kind of early days. Um, and so the field of responsible design or responsible design is a commitment to do better with our work and less harm. Um, and essentially it works to align um, people, business, planet, and society, and requires us to be more thoughtful and holistic. Um, and so responsible design is just an evolved version of human-centered design. It's not meant to replace it. In fact, it just augments that process that we're all familiar with, with more tools and more methods that allow us to ask different questions that we might have otherwise, to look at things with a slightly different lens. Um, and so responsible design um, permeates not only how we understand problems, but also how we understand solutions. Um, and our hope is that responsible design brings a new set of critical lenses that allow us to create more positive outcomes, mitigate long-term risk, create resilient solutions, grow business value, and think about the externalities, whether they're positive or negative. Um, and so it's really important for me to mention that human-centered design has always been a discipline that has um, uh, really um, grounded itself in many other disciplines. So human-centered design was built on psychology, behavioral science, anthropology, um, and other related fields. And what we believe is that going forward, um, not only should it continue to draw upon these fields, but in other ones as well that are well-established, things like ethics, things like systems dynamics, monitoring and evaluation. Um, and so we really hope that you know, um, designers and business leaders are well-versed in these fields um, because we think that that's gonna be critical to uh, coming up with the right types of solutions and creating the better future for all, for all of us. So I'll talk briefly now about um, what the basic tenets or the basic elements are of responsible design and give some examples of some new tools and methodologies that we're developing here at Artifact. So first of all, the most important thing about responsible design is that it's outcomes focused. So responsible design essentially sets a target ahead um, and acknowledges that our solutions may introduce new impacts. So um, human-centered design is slightly different. Um, it does seek to set, uh, to achieve certain outcomes, um, but the way that it does that is it it actually often constrains the solution set. And it does this by establishing what's called design principles. Um, and then essentially, when you have concepts that exist within those constructs, you test them um, and you iterate upon them. Um, but what you're really optimizing for in human-centered design is a solution that works best for people. Um, and responsible design, on the other hand, is slightly different. Um, it spends much more time thinking about the ideal outcome um, because it's looking at not only uh, customer and business outcomes, but it's also looking at societal outcomes. Um, and also when you're thinking about the solution set and you're thinking about a possible solution within it, it's recognizing that when you introduce the solution into the world, you're actually perturbing a system and you might be creating some primary and secondary effects. Um, and so that's something a nuance um, that responsible design has that um, human-centered design hasn't historically focused on. Um, and so, you know, the fields of monitoring and evaluation is a field that's a, it's a disciplined approach to defining outcomes and setting a plan to assess them. And in this world where we're outcomes focused, you know, we need to a plan to continuously assess our solutions to see that if it's truly meeting the outcomes that we had stated at the beginning. Um, and so we think that the field of design has a lot to learn from monitoring and evaluation. Um, and so an example of a method that we're thinking about at Artifact is that um, how can we create prototypes to better understand the problem? So oftentimes in human-centered design, a prototype is meant to um, be an early version of the solution. It's an MVP that goes under a different iteration. But I wonder with responsible design, um, could there be a, a place for us to release prototypes into the world? Not so much to test an early solution, but actually to um, essentially better sense the system and all the other systems that our, our problem is connected to. So it's essentially something that is meant to perturb the system, to reveal it, to know what all the different complexities are in there. Um, it's really hard to understand the full system just by reading some secondary research. Um, and so we're wondering whether there are um, other new methods to release prototypes in such a way 
that would help us better understand the problem and probably even reframe the problem one more time before we actually go into the solution space. Um, the second main point for responsible design is that it has a systems orientation. Um, and so it recognizes um, that the, the, uh, the right solutions um, are often not so simple and requires a broad view. And this, of course, is very appropriate for many um, challenging problems like wicked problems of those that I saw at PATH, which um, are, you know, um, very um, much a, a problem that is systemic in nature, that is, uh, has many layers, layers to it in terms of addressing it. Um, and so essentially, you know, responsible design is acknowledging that nothing exists in a bubble and it's important to understand all those connections and interactions. Um, and um, it realizes that problems are uh, today are systemic in nature and oftentimes there isn't just one solution. Um, and so we believe there's a lot to be learned from mapping and modeling a system like we did here um, where you can see uh, an image where we mapped out uh, the system of social media and all the sort of um, effects that it has uh, on many different aspects of society. Um, and so doing systems mapping like this allowed us to kind of understand how there is a core structure, a deep structure to the system that's essentially based on the business model of Facebook and others um, to essentially drive engagement and to uh, add more and more users. And so this imperative for growth um, and its, its advertising business model is really the root cause for all the sort of consequences of the designs. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, through this mapping, we began to really understand the drivers of isolation, the drivers of addiction, the drivers of misinformation, and the, and, and the drivers that are sort of undermining the, some of the basic uh, tenets of our democracy. Um, so if there's one tip, you know, don't, don't go look at your system dynamics notes or don't forget to, you know, take that class if you're still a student. Um, I think that this is a really important um, sort of training for us to be able to understand very difficult challenges. Um, and so the third point I wanted to bring about responsible design is it has to do with looking at stakeholders quite broadly. Um, in order to be responsible, you have to think about the stakeholders and about who wins and who loses. Um, and essentially, um, you know, we think that it's really important um, for businesses to not only think about investors, consumers, and um, the employees and others who make um, and deliver the company's products and services. It's one thing for a business to think about, um, you know, the, the stakeholders that are under a company's purview, but it's a much more challenging and deliberate action to think about those stakeholders who exist outside of your value chain, who exist outside of your value ecosystem. So the example of airlines, um, thinking about non-users, the 80 to 90% of the world that will never fly an airplane and the consequences of the airline industry to the people who will never be able to afford to fly um, is really important, we think. Um, and probably is a reason why there are um, an option now for you to offset your, um, uh, the carbon emissions that are created from your trip. Um, and so we think there are opportunities for innovation when you think about stakeholders just slightly more broadly than you would have otherwise. And I th we believe that the field of ethics um, is gonna be a really important field to draw upon in order to better understand um, fairness and, uh, and what's right and wrong regarding the different stakeholder groups. So the last point I wanna make about responsible design is that really it's a mindset that requires us to be more intentional and, and more thoughtful. So it's not only a process, but it's actually backed up by a mindset and a philosophy that uh, requires us to, to be aware of, what, of um, the problems we're trying to solve um, and the solutions that we're introducing in the world. Um, and so you might ask, you know, what's the, what's the business rationale? Why is there, what's the value prop essentially for responsible design? Um, and the obvious one is about mitigating long-term risk, right? Whether that's to your reputation, whether that's risk to the business's ability to be resilient um, to its overall business value. This is a large driver for why companies are trying to be more socially conscious and aware. Um, and in fact, if you look at ESG data, um, this is data from environmentally, social, and governments um, organizations, organizations that are deemed to have practices 
practices that sort of look at these double and triple bottom lines. We do see um, from this data from Morgan Stanley, but lots of other researchers has shown that companies that uh, focus on ESG um, do outperform in, in the marketplace. Uh, and so, and, and when you read the reports from all these studies, you realize that the actions that the companies are mostly taking is in the realm of essentially um, mitigating risk. And so that's the reason why they're outperforming. Um, but we believe that a responsible approach to innovation can actually create a much stronger value prop because we think that it will result in better products and services. Um, and so there's a reason for why we think this is the case, and I, there isn't data really that I know of out there. Um, but essentially, the reason why we think in a better innovation, better products and services happen with responsible design is because very simply what you're doing is that you're holding the bar higher um, because you are trying to look for those intersections, those win-win-wins between the um, business, the customers, and through society. Um, and so naturally, when you have a tougher problem to solve, you need more manpower, you need more creativity, you need new lenses, new ways of looking at things, uh, new ways of questioning assumptions. Um, and you know, a lot of innovation, we believe, comes from flipping assumptions, wildly held beliefs that are actually not true. Um, and an example of that is when you look at ride sharing, or if you look at um, you know, the innovations uh, around um, Airbnb, or if you look at peer-to-peer -peer lending, both in developing countries and developed countries, these were all on the premise that, you know, you can't trust strangers. Um, but when you challenge that assumption, you realize that there are some incredible um, products and services that be, can be created, um, and very profitable <laughs> um, products and services that, be, that can be created. And so flipping assumptions, challenging assumptions is a really important part of innovation. And we think that responsible design helps you do that. So one of the tools that we've created to help us question our designs and question ourselves is something called the Tarot Cards of Tech. So this is a set of cards that you can use um, in your design process. It's also available online at our website, artifactgroup.com. Um, so go there and you can get access to this deck of cards. But essentially each one of these cards has a prompt, an ethical prompt, a question that you should ask of yourselves. Um, and I'll give you an example of one of them. It's called the Forgotten. Um, essentially, this is a card uh, that when you draw it out of the deck, um, it gets you and your team to consider whose perspective is missing um, from the product development um, conversations, what assumptions you might be making that might be wrong. Um, you have, it allows you to think about who might be excluded um, in your designs and really question uh, uh, whether your product or experience must be designed in that particular way or whether you can sort of broaden it to be more inclusive. Um, and so I'll give you an example of why um, responsible design can create a new frame that can allow products and services to be even better than it is. Um, and so one thing I've been thinking a lot about and I hope to write some papers on is really thinking about behavioral science and behavioral design and the way that we create these nudges to change user behaviors. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that nudges aren't created equal. And so what I mean by that is um, it's one thing to have a Fitbit and sort of encourage you to go to continue walking, um, you know, to meet your 10,000 steps or what have you. Um, and, and, and it's, um, you know, and it's another thing for uh, a company to create sort of convenient solutions so that you don't have to press next as you're watching a video. Um, and these are all things that are genuinely um, great for users. But when you think um, a little bit deeper, um, sometimes these types of nudges are creating some types of behaviors that are not really in the user's best interest. It might be in the company's best interest, but it may not be in the user's. So um, when you look at uh, ride sharing apps and how they help drivers achieve a weekly financial goal, um, you know, we have to think a lot about the driver and how on some days, maybe on a Friday, they've been driving, um, you know, for many hours um, and they're getting the this nudge which says, you know what, and, and the driver's about to log off for the day, he's exhausted, and the, and the app says, you know, if you just do two more rides, if you ride for another hour or so, you're going to get up to your $1,000 goal. Um, and they might, you know, then decide, okay, yeah, I probably should continue driving. But is that really the safe thing to do? Is that really the right thing to do um, for the end user? Um, and so this con context actually really matters 
Um, and in fact, Uber has that contextual information. It knows how long you've been on. Perhaps when technology sort of per pervades our car, it'll know when you're kind of nodding off to sleep. Um, and so can we stitch all this together and really help create these more nuanced nudges that are truly in the user's best interest? Same thing with um, watching any video streaming uh, software where, um, you know, we've all, all been in a situation where we've watched one too many shows and it's really late at night and we regret it in the morning. Um, and I think there is actually a, va a valid business argument for companies to be on the user's side to be a trusted partner in helping you manage your time in such a way that you don't feel guilty. You don't sort of say, oh, well, I'll just stop watching Netflix for a few days because I feel horrible that I just um, haven't been able to be awake enough in the morning to, to get my daughter ready to school or to, to head into the office. Um, we think that there is an opportunity for companies to sort of challenge the assumptions and challenge the designs that they already have. Um, to create a more trusted relationship where Netflix is on my side to help me manage my day, to help me uh, wind down for the evening. Um, and so we think that there is some really interesting innovations that can happen when you think about uh, nudges in particular in a more ethical way. So just to conclude, um, you know, we think it's an exciting time, um, not only because technology is an amplifier um, and it's an amplifier for both good and bad, um, but also because actually there are many um, business leaders out there who are questioning the way that our society works um, and thinking um, of, uh, of a more holistic approach to uh, products and innovation. So for example, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, said that society is increasingly turning to the private sector and asking that companies um, respond uh, to the broader societal challenges and think long term. And thought leaders like John Thackeray have been um, writing books on how to thrive in the next economy, really um, encouraging people to go from a less harm perspective to a leave things for the better perspective. Um, so I think the time is right for us to be able to be more responsible as designers and I guess I wanted to end on um, a point for business leaders, for all of you uh, uh, alumni to really think as business leaders and innovators, how can we all do our part to create a better future? So thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to continue the conversation with any of you. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my name and email address is on the Artifact website. Um, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you and then actually today, right now with the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Niti. And as a reminder to our participants, you may type in your questions in the Q&A panel in the Zoom interface. And while you're doing that, I'll take a moment to tell you about some of our upcoming events. On Thursday, October 24th, uh, the MIT Alumni Association will be hosting a Career Lunch and Learn webinar with Sloan faculty member Jason Jay on the power of conversation in a polarized world. So definitely tune in for that, something we all need here. <laughs> um, and the following week on October 31st, uh, we'll be joined by Sloan alumna Clara Brenner, MBA class of 2012. She is the co-founder and managing partner of the Urban Innovation Fund, which is a venture capital firm that provides seed capital and regulatory support to entrepreneurs who are shaping the future of cities. So another great topic. We'd love to have you join us. You can register for these and more sessions on the MIT Sloan alumni online website. You can also find links to previously recorded sessions on our YouTube channel. So with that, we'll go to our questions. And we have a few teed up from our pre-registration, but please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A panel in the Zoom interface. So our first question comes from Jill Christians, uh, SM94. She's based here in Boston. So how do you incorporate accessibility into your design thinking? Or how has that been the process at Artifact? Oh, that's a great question. Um, accessibility is a really important part of being inclusive and responsible. Um, and it's something that our designers at Artifact are, uh, uh, have done past training in, and we continue to learn a little bit more about accessibility. Um, I think one of the most important things about accessibility is really defining it, um, but one element of it is um, having to do with creating our digital apps and websites in such a way that it is viewable and readable by um, people of, of all types. And so we've done um, trainings and, and, and tried to understand the right types of colors 
to put together um, uh, side by side and to, to include on our uh, websites and apps in such a way that it can be seen, seen with people with all, um, with all different types of color blindness. So that's just one small example of how, how we incorporate accessibility into our process. Um, and, um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is actually that a lot of people have been thinking about accessible design, specifically um, some of our, um, um, one of our clients and also a, a good partner for us is Microsoft and they're really leaders in, in accessible and design thinking. Um, and they have a wonderful resource online about accessibility. So I encourage you all to sort of look at that resource. It's something that we incorporate into our own thinking. Um, but again, I think it is still early days in terms of how we're thinking about accessibility. There's just a lot more to be done. So thank you for that question, Joe. Thanks, Niti. So one of the questions that has come in um, live from our viewers, um, this is from Stan Dorst. Um, he asks, isn't this what companies have always done, building things for people's needs? So what is it that makes um, this process different? Or Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the subtle difference there is that, that um, in building things for people's needs, human-centered design has always put people uh, front and center, um, but it has historically focused more on um, out, it, it, and so in, in picking the solution set and defining them, um, it, it essentially uses uh, a set of outcomes or desired goals, even KPIs, um, key performance indicators around what the solution should be, and that often constrains a solution set. But um, oftentimes when you're trying to optimize and pick the best solution in that set, what it does is that it's essentially then making decisions based on usability principles. So what is the most sort of um, easiest to use, most intuitive to use, what have you. And I think that's great. It, it results in these wonderful products out there. Um, however, it's different from responsible design because um, it assumes that everything is static um, because, and which is not the case. So when you introduce something into a system, it becomes different um, because of the nature of the innovation. So if you look at scooters, for example, and these scooter sharing services, it's not simply just um, adding the scooters into a transportation system and providing one more option, but you're actually perturbing the system by the introduction of it. It leads to um, behaviors that you may not anticipate it and what have you. Um, and so responsible design is a little bit more forward focused, a little bit more outcomes focused, a little bit more long-term focused than historically human-centered design has been. Great, thank you. Um, Niti, we were talking about this a little bit before the session, but I was, uh, thinking of a popular meme that our viewers may have seen. Um, it's a photograph of a sidewalk where there's a beautifully laid out path uh, going one direction and then um, right next to it there's a well-tread dirt path um, and the joke is user design versus user experience. So um, it relates to a question that uh, came in um, from Stephen Alter, um, PhD 75. He asks, how should designers take into account the foreseeable workarounds of whatever it is they design? Right. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think that's a really great question. Um, so, I mean, the, the quick answer to that is that a very fundamental part of the design process is to uh, test and to create prototypes of the design and test it in the market um, and try to sort of see what emergent user behaviors um, happen. So it is a little hard to anticipate that people might be taking the shortcut rather than the long way around uh, sometimes. Um, and so there's sort of emergent behaviors or emergent use, uses of your product in a way that you might not imagine. Um, and so uh, oftentimes by placing it in the market in a very small sort of constrained way allows you to kind of observe those types of behaviors. Um, the other part that um, designers I think need to continue to draw upon and think about is um, really the field of uh, behavioral economics and the fields of anthropology where we think about um, what's human nature. So um, if we, um, in the design process, even before we develop a prototype, um, it's really important to think about um, what dictates human be behavior and how do most people behave. Um, and the field of economics um, and behavioral science has a lot to say on how irrational we are or how we, type of be we behave to optimize our own utility. Um, and so there's all these fields that we can draw upon to kind of better anticipate and guess 
um, how people might behave in a particular uh, way. So I think by thinking about um, those disciplines early on, as well as the important, very important process of, of testing and prototyping, we can tend to be a little bit better um, at trying to see those, those workarounds that happen um, in the real world. Thank you, great. So uh, there was a recent article on design thinking um, produced by the MIT Sloan Office of Communications. Um, and there's a provocative quote um, that uh, stands out at the top of that article that says, coming up with an idea is easy, coming up with the right one takes work. So, Niti, how do you know when you have the right idea? Or when are you done in a process like this that almost seems like it has no end? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, actually, I'm here today on MIT campus, right here in um, E60, kind of excited to be here. Um, and I was just thinking about this very question this morning because I happened to see an image um, of Alfred P. Sloan, um, and next to his image um, downstairs, here in the building essentially says that, uh, you know, um, the school, school will never be finished um, in a world that's moving so rapidly forward. Um, and I know this is something the Dean as well has mentioned uh, many times, and it's true, it's true in every field, it's true in design. Um, you're never really quite finished, uh, things are always changing. Um, and I think one of the things about software design is that it allows you to continue to iterate even after the product has been adopted by many um, hundreds or even billions of people. Uh, hardware was very different where you had to um, unfortunately uh, replace that product with a Gen 2 or Gen 3 that then created piles of trash. Um, so iteration was possible. However, there were some yeah, significant consequences to, to it. Um, and so ultimately, um, it, a lot of this process doesn't really quite have an end, especially as you're thinking about services and systems. Um, and so um, it's really just a matter of focus and attention. I think some of the reasons why we don't often um, continue to iterate on products is because of prioritization. So I know um, of teams at Amazon where they've launched a product into a world um, and then they're moving teams to another product team where they can work on the next best thing. And then these, some of these old products um, are still out there but not really well supported in the, in the way that they should be. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really difficult to know when you have the right idea, the one that actually works, um, and when to stop. But I think that um, it's a continual conversation. It's about priorities. It's about companies looking um, not only near-term products and solutions that are in their pipeline, but looking farther out and kind of connecting it all in a way that keeps uh, uh, their end user in the center of it. Thank you. And we yeah. have another question um, from our live audience. So um, this is from Andy Merkin, SM2010, who's based okay. in Los Angeles. Um, and so shifting gears a little bit to thinking about data. Okay. Um, and so if you're relying on data to create design, how does responsible design counter uh, the echo chamber of the historical data that um, reinforces previous trends? So how do, you, how do you anticipate that? How do you deal with that um, in this process? Yeah, so that is a really great question. Um, I'm leading a program right now that is focused on thinking of 2030 um, in terms of um, imagining what the ideal experience would be for us to take our medications. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is because the way we designed our program is actually to take multiple inputs. Um, and so in order to get out of an echo chamber where we just find those trends that are gonna shape 2030 or those data points that just reinforce our perspective on the world, we are forcing ourselves as part of this process, not only us as designers who are not necessarily with our client day to day, but also challenging our client as well by um, having data come in from multiple inputs. And so what I mean by that is it's not only through the secondary research, it's one thing to digest the McKinsey reports and the Deloitte reports for 2030, and they all tend to say maybe similar things, but it's another thing then to talk to, um, you know, uh, subject matter experts, either whether they're starting up a, a new startup um, or whether uh, these experts are academics that have been in the field uh, thinking about long-term trends for about 34 years, um, we always include the perspective of these experts that in some ways can be contrarians to the, the, the um, conversation that's happening uh, currently. Um, and then we also uh, do a lot of user research as well, hearing directly from users about what their needs are, what their fears are, and grounding um, our designs and thinking 
in, into real meat. It's, I think, one thing that we sometimes lose when we're sort of repeating the same ideas, we're looking at the same data, is that you lose why the data matters. Um, and so it's really important for us to marry the qualitative and the quantitative together. Um, and so it's, you can't, we rarely make um, recommendations to our clients based on charts and graphs. Um, it is really enriched by uh, our intuition and from our understanding of, of the people that we're serving. So really not a short answer to that one, but um, it's you know something that's always very difficult. But as a design agency, the thing we sell is a fresh perspective. The thing we sell is innovation. If we can't do that as a firm, we shouldn't exist. <laughs> um, so it's pretty stressful working at Artifact. Um, but, um, but I think when you uh, bring in people who are looking at things from maybe uh, being exposed from different industries, um, that are working outside of your company, um, you can really learn a lot more than you would if you just keep sort of talking to the same people over and over again. Thank you. Um, and another question that has come in and kind of relates to Artifact, actually. Okay. Um, so um, how does Artifact choose its clients and kind of make decisions, um, especially with the emphasis on ethics and yes. um, that sort of thing, if you have any comments? Oh yeah, that's a great one. We have that live conversation with our leadership all the time. Um, so we're a small firm um, and I'm very close to our, uh, the co-founders of Artifact. They are, they're working every day side by side with me and the rest of leadership. And we do talk about um, defining our set of target clients um, and we look at various metrics to kind of assess um, whether they're viewed as an ethical company, whether they're viewed as a socially responsible company. Um, and that is our essentially short list, but it's a relatively long list actually. There are many, many great companies out there. A short list of target clients for us, but that's really for proactive outreach and how we think about the business in terms of um, you know, who we wanna work with. And then there's always the incoming pings, right? The, the people who are very interested in working with us because of our past portfolio of work and what have you. And there, sometimes, you know, there are um, requests um, from these clients to produce things that we think um, may be a little too hairy for us. Um, and so we um, have to make the decision to decline that business. And we've done that many times in the past. Um, it's always a hard conversation, though, for us to figure out because the question is like, but could we just change them a little bit, make them a little bit more ethical. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's it's a gray area and we have to think a lot about, um, you know, whether we want to, uh, what types of clients we want to work with. Um, but we work across, you know, both private sector, public sector, um, nonprofits, what have you, um, and try to get a, a nice diversity from, you know, from groups like the Gates Foundation to uh, the Microsoft and Samsung's of the world uh, to large pharmaceutical companies like the one I'm working with. Um, and, and so there are incredible uh, companies that are doing exciting things that we get to partner with. So I'm very grateful for that. Thanks, Nikki. And we're coming up to the top of the hour. So okay. I want to close us out for the day with one last question. So what are you most excited about now in your work at Artifact? Um, and maybe can you give, it, give us a glimpse of what's on the horizon? OK, yeah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being interested in this topic. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's my passion area, as you can tell. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really excited about um, at Artifact is more and more companies wanting to take a long-term view. Um, and so we think that that's really important for us to be able to uh, help our clients be more intentional about the products and services they create. So not only are we helping um, create uh, what the next generation products might be, but we're looking to, um, as I mentioned, the 2030 timeframe and helping develop their product plans and roadmaps all the way until then. Um, and something um, really great happens when you can take a long-term view and you can create a long-term vision for your clients. And essentially it's that it creates a vision that aligns the entire company around and it allows them to um, have the time to continue to um, strive towards that vision, but also to iterate and pivot as needed as they're learning things along the way. Um, the, one of the things that really um, is difficult for responsible design is sort of the short-termism that we see in the financial markets, sort of always looking um, at quick returns um, and how do we quickly sort of throw products into the market to grow, drive growth. 
Um, and one of the things we often say is that time is the enemy of responsibility. Um, and so um, one of, you know, if by shipping fast, by breaking things, um, that type of philosophy is very difficult. Um, that type of pressure we understand um, is there, but it actually uh, prevents you from being a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more aware. Um, and these are the essential tenets of responsible design. So um, I'm excited that, you know, I've got to work on two large projects, one in the um, mobility space, automotive mobility space, and then now in the pharmaceutical space, kind of thinking long-term, um, because I think that's where the greatest opportunity is. Great, thank you, Niti. You've given us a lot to think about, and thank you for joining us for MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to thank all of our viewers for joining us. To keep this conversation going on social media, you can use the hashtag SloaneChat. And following this event, you will receive a survey via email as well as a link to the recording. So please fill that out and let us know your feedback on this session as well as our ongoing lineup of events. As always, you can reach out to us at Sloan Alumni Online at MIT.edu. Thanks for joining us today.